So the next talk is about Rubato, uh, noisy cipher for approximate homomorphic encryption. This is joint work by uh, Jinshou Ha, Seong Kwang Kim, Byung, that's tough, Bai On Gak Lee, Zhou Yong Li, and Michelle Son. And the talk will be given by Seong Kwang. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, this is Song Gwang Kim, and this is a joint work with Jin Chai Ha, Pyeong Li, Ji Young Li, and Min Chai Son from KAIST. I'm from Samsung SDS. Today, what I want to talk about is Rubato noisy ciphers for approximate homomorphic encryption. Let's begin with homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption is an encryption scheme that enables addition and multiplication over encrypted data. Some might think about uh, partially homomorphic encryption, but in this talk, we say HE. This implies that <clears throat> uh, exact homomorphic encryption or approximate homomorphic encryption that supports addition and multiplication. For example, there is a uh, famous example, FE scheme for modular ring and CKK scheme for complex ring. For this reason, H can, HE can protect data even when they are being used. For example, homomorphic encryption is used machine learning inference and statistics of sensitive data while preserving privacy. Uh, recent homomorphic encryption schemes have two demerits. The first one is slow encryption speed. Uh, usually, homomorphic encryption schemes use super large parameters our LWE sample. So it is very, very slow compared to conventional symmetric ciphers. The second one is large ciphertext expansion. Ciphertext expansion refers to how much ciphertext is expanded from its plain text. So homomorphic ciphertext is 10 times to a million times larger according to the choice of parameters. Uh, it causes large memory and network bandwidth overhead. Yeah, so to resolve this problem, Lauter et al. proposed transciphering framework, uh, which is a conversion from symmetric ciphertext to a homomorphic ciphertext. So let's suppose a client want to del delegate a computation to a server. Uh, someone might think that a client naively send to the server a homomorphic ciphertext and computation. But it's, uh, I said earlier, uh, it, is, it caused a large network bandwidth overhead. So by using transciphering framework, a client send only homomorphically encrypted keys and uh, encrypt all the messages by symmetric cipher and send the server. Then server, given symmetric cipher text and evaluating decryption circuit that can result in homomorphic cipher text of messages. So by using transciphering framework, client can encrypt faster and get smaller ciphertext. Uh, for real numbers, in Asia Crypt 20, 2021, Cho et al. proposed RTF framework, which is a transciphering framework for approximate, num approximate numbers. Uh, on the client side, the real messages is scaled and rounded so that it's converted into a integer modulo T and a key stream of a cipher is added. On the server side, uh, FE evaluation of the cipher and CKK bootstrapping results in a CKK cipher text of the message. Uh, in the trend ciphering framework, there is a symmetric cipher and the cipher is evaluated 
both in clear and while encrypted. So in this sense, the cipher should be efficiently evaluated by homomorphic encryption. We call it HE-friendly cipher. Uh, so far in most hardware, and gates and XOR gates needs roughly the same resources. However, in homomorphic encryption schemes, uh, multiplication is much more expensive than addition. So to design HE-friendly ciphers, low multiplicative depth and complexity are required. HE-friendly ciphers are domain critical. When the cipher, when the domain of the cipher is fixed, then the compu further computation after transciphering is done on that domain. At first, uh, HE-friendly uh, ciphers are proposed, were proposed uh, for binary use cases. There are low MC, Cravium, Flip, Rasta, and Dasta. Uh, after that, uh, it was known that Modular ring is more appropriate for integer arithmetic and batching technique for HE. So HE-friendly ciphers over modular ring have been proposed, such as Masta, Pasta, and Hera. Finally, approximate home, for approximate homomorphic encryption, H-friendly ciphers are, have been proposed, and Roboto, Today, what I'm talking about is in this case. The, one of the main question is, is there any way to reduce the multiplicative depth drastically? There is some observation. For deterministic cipher, there is a critical line in multiplicative depth for every key size. In case of flip, uh, the key size is 1394 bits and multiplicative depth is four. And for, in case of Rasta, the key size is 351 bits and multiplicative depth six. However, in case of uh, noisy encryption, we found that LW encryption does not require non-scalar multiplication and is secure. Here is the table of HE-friendly ciphers and related metrics. So you can see the first column, modulus of the plain text, number of keywords, and multiplicative depth, and number of multiplication per output word, number of random bits per output word. And the first row, you can see the HE-friendly ciphers are sorted in chronological order except LWE. In the blue row, you can see multiplicative depths are does not go below four, even uh, since flip was proposed, but LWE achieves multiplicative depth zero and multiplication zero. So it was very great for transciphering framework, but in fact, it is not because it is too long to uh, evaluate in clear. So we have to modify it. So we got an idea. We try to mix together. So mix with stream cipher and LTV encryption. So we try to design a stream cipher with Gaussian noise. Then there can be a security for algebraic attacks. So for algebraic attacks, we can say two aspects. The first one is Grabner basis attack. Here, Grabner NMD means that the complexity of solving the system of equation of n variable m equation of degree d. When guess, uh, when the error is added, the complexity of guessing error is multiplied to the complexity of Grebner basis attack. 
So it implies that with same security, the degree D can decrease to D prime. The second one is Aurora Geotech. It's an algebraic algorithm to solve LWE. Uh, <clears throat> it is uh, for dot products. It is LW because of LWE structure, the dot product is in their equation. Uh, but in, in, the, the, uh, in the stream cipher case, the dot product becomes polynomial. So whole equation becomes of higher degree and we can get smaller number of variables for the same security level. In fact, LW decryption needs round of function, which is not easy to evaluate in exact homomorphic encryption. But in approximate homomorphic encryption, LWE noise can be regarded as error and we don't need to round off. So here we introduce a family of noisy ciphers, Rubato. Rubato is named after a musical term, tempo rubato, which means expressive and rhythmic freedom. In, for this name, we mean that parameters can be chosen freely for its purpose. So the rubato is stream si word wise str stream cipher with Gaussian noise and stream cipher is like in this figure and uh, the stream cipher part is SPN network, uh, SP network with randomized key schedule. Uh, the in the round function, it uses hair like linear layer and pasta like S box layer. You can you could see pasta in the last Sunday in fh.org conference. Roboto is composed of fixed constant input and randomized key schedule and truncation Gaussian noise addition. We can, uh, yeah. Roboto support three types of block size, which is small, medium, large, and small is 16 and medium is 36 and large is 64 words. When block size is larger, the required number of rounds decreases. So larger block size means larger throughput and smaller block implies smaller latency. We adopt hair-like linear layers, which composed of mixed columns and mixed rows. Uh, in figure one, you can see that there are V square states of X becomes V square states of Y, and it goes to figure two. There are mixed column and mixed row. Mixed columns multiply a fixed MDS matrix to state of X in column wise, and mixed rows multiplies the same matrix to the row wise. The MDS matrix is defined in figure three. You can see that. And there are only 16, a block of 16 matrix is defined in Hera. So we have to find for 36 and 64. So we uh, brute forcely find a small component V by V MDS matrix with circulant metrics. So in for nonlinear layers, we adopt Feistel network in a row. It is used in pasta and it's a quadratic invertible function. Quadratic function gives the least multiplicative depth for a uh, fixed algebraic degree. In Hera, round function is used round function is cubic function because of its algebraic, because to defend algebraic meet in the middle attack, 
But for Roboto, truncation is defend truncation defends the algebraic mid in the middle attack. Finally, adding Gaussian noise, it, it generates the key stream of Roboto. Here is the round function of Roboto, and you can see the phi style in a phi style in a row and linear layer and uh, key addition. Here is a comparison of multiplication related value between Rubato and other HG friendly ciphers. You can see that Rubato is Rubato achieves multiplicative depth two with moderate block size and small random bits per output word. And furthermore, Rubato achieves 2.1 multiplication per output word. Here we brief introduce, briefly introduce security analysis of Roboto. For symmetric key cryptanalysis, we guess the Gaussian noise and apply the usual symmetric key cryptanalysis. For linear and differential cryptanalysis, it can be it cannot be used with guess and determine attack. So we compute the linear and differential probability without Gaussian noise. For L2B cryptanalysis, we linearize all the monomial and do the lattice attack or BKW attack for linearized lattice. For the SVP oracle, we considered both sieves and enumerations. For Aurora Gay attack, uh, it is not the best idea to use linearization. So we replace the dot product to a polynomial. It's just a stream cipher part. So we give the selected parameters in the table. You can see security, block size, truncation size. Truncation size means that what it what is left not truncated. And log two of plain text modulus and alpha q, which is sigma, which is standard deviation over square root two pi and number of rounds. Uh, we measure the complexity of attacks and arrange the arranging this table. So you can see the table below and this table is scale of log two. So it's like GCD attack for eight parameter 80 small is two to the power of 393.6. And you can see that Grebner basis attack and our gay attacks are dominant attacks for Roboto. Uh, one might think that where is the security margin? It is symmetric crypto, but we set the linear algebra constant omega as two for security margin. Here's the performance. Performance is evaluated with AVX2 instructions for client-side encryption and RTF framework implemented in Let's Go library for server-side encryption. We chose Shake256 for extendable output function, and we fix uh, RLW dimension, number of slots, and remaining level. So we can you can see ciphertext size, ciphertext expansion ratio, client and server performance, and precision. You can see that uh, larger block size gives larger throughput, smaller block size gives smaller latency, but not for 80s because it's uh, round, number of rounds does not decrease for the larger block size. So it's complicated for 80s. Here are com performance comparison. We compare Roboto to Hera, LWE to RLWE conversion, and CKKS only environment. LWE to RLWE encryption is from Pegasus, which is published in 
IEEE S&P 2021. And we, for the fair comparison, we try to make same level, same remaining level, log of slots and uh, for what? Precision, yes. Uh, but you can see the LWE2 RLW conversion is uh, low log of slots and low precision because implementation of it supports only this, only support this parameter. So we cannot do that. Uh, so you can see that Roboto of uh, throughputs, both throughputs of Roboto uh, outperforms of others. Here's the conclusion. Uh, we present a family of noisy ciphers for approximate homomorphic encryption, and it is a combination of stream cipher and Gaussian noise. We give modular cryptanalysis for noisy ciphers. We show that the noisy ciphers are efficient in approximate homomorphic encryption. There are a few further questions. Is, is there any application of noisy ciphers? We So far, we only found that uh, Trend ciphering application for approximate homomorphic encryption is only, but it could be a another application for MPC or ZK friendly ciphers. And second one is: is there any cryptanalysis which exploits both stream cipher structure and noise? You can see that we have analyzed for linearized lattice problem, but there could be a efficient let an efficient algorithm for a linearized lattice problem like ideal lattice problem. So thank you. Check out the full version at link below. Okay, same game again. Do we have a question for our speaker? Yes. Not everyone was partying tonight. Yesterday night. Wow. <laughs> Hello. Oh. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, so in one of your slides, you mentioned a succulent, succulent matrix. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, could you clarify again why do we need this circular matrix to be MDS? Uh, that's a good question, but it's not. Uh, in fact, it's not. Uh, we do not. Uh, we oh. do not. We don't have to choose with circular matrix, but for uh, the size of brute force, we just mm, restrict the domain of brute force to circular matrix. Uh, okay, thank you. No one has another question? Then I have one. Uh, can you show us again the slide comparing the depths and the randomness of the various cipher? Uh -huh. Yes, I think it was this one. Yes, I'm a bit confused by the LWE parameter here. So, I mean, for example, you could choose one of the NIST finalists and that would have much smaller modulus and much less random bits than, than what is given here. Can you comment? Uh, sorry, can you... Uh... So the LWE parameters that are given here looks yeah. huge compared to standard learning with error schemes such as, as the NIST candidate. Uh, really, Saber, yes. LWE, uh, Saber, or Kyber, or Intru. Right, right. But it's like a, a trend ciphering application. So we need to make the same modulus for the same size of uh, messages, transport of messages. To So I think it could be a... So the, modulus, the modulus here is the plain text modulus or ciphertext modulus? It's a plain text modulus. I see. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. And if there is no other question, let's uh, give another thanks to our speaker.
and the final talk of this session will be called the field instruction to multiple data. This is joint work by uh, Kim Mimi Ong and Henry Lim, Jung Ji Sim, Thank Benjamin you. Hong, Meng Tan, Yuok San Wong, and Tse Ling Yeo. And the talk will be given by Yuni. Oh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jin Jie, and today I'll be presenting our work on field instruction multiple data. Okay, great works. So I'll give a quick introduction to homomorphic encryption first. So uh, homomorphic encryption, as we heard twice earlier this morning, is essentially a way to compute encrypted data, to perform computations on encrypted data. So we have a message, we encrypt, we perform some encrypted, some function on it that when we decrypt, we get a plain text as if we apply a function on the plain text message itself. So there are applications in bioinformatics and in finance. So one feature about uh, homomorphic encryption that we have is the SIMD uh, packing. So this allows us to pack multiple data into a single ciphertext. So and when we apply the function on a single cipher on the ciphertext, it's equivalent to applying the same function on every individual uh, messages. There are also rotation and shifts uh, operations that allow us to uh, do intra vector uh, operations. So we can shift the vectors around. So this essentially improves the efficiency of homomorphic encryption schemes by reducing the number of ciphertexts needed in uh, general computations. So how is this possible? Is because of the encoding, uh, this encoding feature that we have. So the data is first encoded into a plain text space, RT, before we encrypt the message. The plain text space can actually be decomposed into slots, as you can, as you can see here, via the Chinese remainder theorem. One interesting feature is that each slot is actually isomorphic to some finite extension field of degree D. So the isomorphism is there. So uh, usually when we want to uh, instantiate homomorphic encryption schemes, we always choose some powers of two cyclotomics, namely because of a standardization effort and there are fast negocyclic FFT algorithms that we can use to speed up the ring operations. So when we try to maximize the number of slots in a HE ciphertext, what turns out that we always have to use large primes. Like in this case, we have to use a prime of around 41,000 to get the maximum slots in a ciphertext. So, but if we use, consider using smaller primes like three or seven, we are left with only two slots and a very large extension degree. So in this work, we try to answer the question, can we use smaller primes and still encode almost as much data? To this end, we use something called RMFE, reverse multiplication friendly embeddings, I was shared earlier. So let me give an introduction to uh, what's RMFE all about. You can think of it as a homomorphism, a pseudo homomorphism from a vector space to an extension field. So we can embed some len k vector into an extension field of degree d. So uh, sorry, degree w. And in this case, we want w to be less than d, which is the degree of the slot in the homomorphic ciphertext. We do this homomorphism via something called a Rayman rock space. And for those who are not function field theories out there, it's essentially you can think of them as a special set of polynomials uh, characterized by some curve C. So the homomorphism uh, in this uh, setting will be uh, coordinate wise addition and multiplication translating to element wise addition and multiplication in the extension field. So uh, here are some basic maps we have with RMFEs. So first, uh, we define two maps from pi uh, from the Riemann rock spaces called pi and tau, and we can compose, encode, and decode like in the right direction. So encode goes from the vector space to the extension field, and decode goes from the extension field to the vector space. So uh, pi and tau are actually linear maps. So encode and decode are now linear maps, which makes it very easy to implement in H. -E. We also have another uh, basic map called the recode function. So what this does, it brings us from the extension field back to itself. Uh, why is this so? It's actually because of a quirk when we use the Rayman rock spaces. So the function field theory tells us that when we have two polynomials in L of G, so that's the Rayman rock space. So if we have F and G in L of G, when we multiply them, they actually exist. The product exists in a higher dimensional space, L of 2G. So you can see here I define pi from L of G and tau from L of 2G. So that after I do the multiplication in the extension field, I can uh, map it to an uh, actual object in the L of 2G space. 
Hence, uh, we can only like support one multiplication. And so after every uh, multiplication, we actually have to do a recode that goes to the factor space and back to the extension field. So if you are familiar with uh, HE relinearization, it is almost the same idea. So in this work, we actually try to uh, describe how to use RMFEs with a uh, homomorphic encryption. So we call it free instruction multiple data, mainly because we are using extension fields. So this is how we encode data uh, with RMFE and homomorphic encryption. So we have a string of data or multiple data. What we first do is we chop them up into K pieces. Uh, and then we take every K section, like in the one in orange, we put them into one RMFE encode and so on and so forth. So we get many of the few, uh, finite few elements and then we all pack them into one uh, CIMD ciphertext and we encrypt it as per usual in HE. So the decoding works in the, the other direction, like trivially. The operations that come with FIMD, uh, we have addition. This is a natural HE consequence. We have multiplication. As I mentioned earlier, we do normal HE mount, and then we need to do a recode after that because we only support one multiplication with RMFEs. Uh, we also have a rotate and shift functionality, uh, but this one is a little bit more complicated. So you actually have to count the slots that you will be rotating by first in the SIMD setting. That's why there's a P SIMDK. And then after that, we shift it internally in the RMFE uh, setting. So the RMFE rotation is also a linear map. So we can all compose them together nicely. Uh, we have two extensions on how we apply RMFE in our work FIMD. So namely, the first one is called the R4 RMFE. And the second one is a three-stage record process for composite RMFEs. I'll start with the R4 RMFEs first. So recall earlier that I mentioned we define uh, the tau from L of 2G. So in this extension, we instead define tau from some 2 to the power of G, 2 to the power of RG. Okay, so this in some sense support, allows us to support R multiplications before actually need to do a recode. And so we assign a tag to the ciphertext and say that like, when we reach the number of, uh, the, when we reach the value of R, then we do a recode. So what this <clears throat> essentially does is that uh, usually for the homomorphic encryption extension fields, they are actually much larger than what we can have with the RMIP Raymond Rock spaces. So this allows us to use the whole field extension uh, and it's more efficient this way. So this also reduces the number of RMIP recodes, which is actually a costly process. An interesting feature is that there's actually interoperability between uh, data that's multiplied different times. So if you have two pieces of data in like 2G and 4G, then they can actually be multiplied together also. Next, I'll move on to the three-stage record for composite RMFEs. So composite RMFEs are just a way to build big RMFEs using smaller ones instead of the one I mentioned earlier. So we have an inner one and an outer one. So the inner one starts from the base field FT, and then the outer one uh, starts from some intermediate field uh, F of TW in. So uh, we kind of like just stack the RMFEs together. So we take K in many data, encode them in RMFEs, and we take K out many of such encodings and embed them into the, the outer RMFEs. So it's kind of like a similar composition idea that we have earlier. So this is composite, right? So how the, why the composite actually works is because we can actually decompose uh, X finite extension fields into towers of few extension as given there. So this actually reduces the cost of linear maps, which is why we are looking at this. So for example, the example I have here, uh, when we want to talk about mapping of F3K to something of extension field of degree 2048, the encode map will actually be something, uh, will actually cost 2048 columns, but using a composite RMFE with an intermediate field of degree 16, we actually use more uh, matrices of column 16 and then one outer matrices of column 2, 0, 1 to 8. So the size is much cheaper to use the composite ones. So the three-stage record process for composite RMFEs is actually, uh, so yeah, we, we do this to not record directly from the extension field all the way to the base inner field. So in this, the first step is we perform a decode from the extension field to the intermediate field. And then we do a recode on the intermediate field to the base field. And then we encode it backwards to the extension field. So you can see uh, step one, step three, they actually perform over the intermediate field. And the second recode is over the smallest base field. Uh, so we optimize this further by extending 
it, the, RMA, the inner and outer RMFEs to R4 RMFEs. So this will actually delay the inner recode needed. So when we do step one, we can actually recode at the intermediate field until it's necessary. Then we do the, out, the inner recode and then we can go back. Right. So I'll share some experimental results that we have uh, with RMFEs. So uh, the RMFE parameters that we chose, uh, so earlier I mentioned the Raymond Rock space is characterized by the curve C. So we chose three different curves here, the projective curve, elliptic curve, and the Hermitian curve. So each curve actually gives us a different value of K. So you can see uh, there, the projective curve gives us the smallest number of points that we can encode, while the Hermitian gives us the most. The Hermitian also is over, defined over some base field T square. So actually, when we uh, want to apply this into uh, HE, the slot degree is actually half effectively. For the HE setup, so we chose small primes like three or seven, and we set to 80-bit security. So what we do is we actually prepare two ciphertexts. The first one is the usual HE ciphertext. The second one is encoded with the FIMD encoding described earlier. And then we do repeated squarings until the multiplication fails. We record the time and the number of multiplications done that uh, allows us to decrypt correctly. And so I compared the amortized speed up between the FIMD ciphertext multiplication and the HE ciphertext multiplication. So for some R4 RMFE results. So you can see here that uh, we can only perform less FIMD multiplications compared to HE multiplications. So we have around three to four, while HE has uh, five multiplications. So this actually gives us a sense of uh, how much noise is consumed when we do a FIMD multiplication compared to a HE multiplication as the two ciphertexts have the same, uh, were initialized with the same noise budget. So uh, I would like to say this is mainly because of the recode process that's baked into the FIMD multiplications. Uh, more here, where if you see when I set R equals to one, this means that I actually do a recode after every FIMD multiplications. For R4 equals to four, I actually do one record after four multiplications, and you can see the time difference of about 2.5 seconds. So since we actually noticed that for HE ciphertext, they actually only support up to four FIMD multiplications, we actually did another experiment where after four FIMD multiplications, we did not do the record, and that's in the start row that you can see there. So we have a much better amortized speed up uh, in this setting. Uh, so comparing the type of curve that was chosen and in consequentially the number of points that we can encode, it appears that curves that actually give more points will give a better amortized speed up without much R4, uh, without, much R, without, without increasing the value of R compared to the smaller curves like projective and elliptic curves. Right. Uh, next, I'll move on to the composite RMFE uh, results. So here's a comparison between uh, the R4 RMFEs and the composite RMFEs. So the first thing you notice is that we can only do, we definitely do much lesser uh, FIMD multiplications for composites than for uh, R4s, uh, namely because the cost of the linear maps in composites are much bigger than those in R4. So yeah. So, uh, but however, the saving part about composite RMFEs is that the packing uh, efficiency of composite RMFEs are much better. So I computed a, a value D over K, which measures how much, uh, so D is the degree of the slot divided by K, the number of points you can pack into a slot. Smaller is better. So you can see that uh, composite RMFEs actually offer much better packing efficiency. And also as a result, a better amortized speed up time. So uh, this is a comparison between the three-stage recode and a direct recode for RMFEs. Uh, so we didn't compute the direct map, the direct recode map for composite seven projective curve because it was too large. So we tried to estimate it by using the closest R4 RMFE, which is 7H, of a similar K value. So we, by extrapolating the, the record timing, we find that actually the three-stage record is much faster at 0 0.75 seconds per FIMD mount compared to uh, extrapolated direct record timing at 1.2 seconds. Yep. Uh, so this one is, so, right. so we actually also looked at how should we vary the 
value of R4 for inner for the inner RMFEs. And so you can see that when we increase the R4 we, from one to two, we get a much better, uh, we get a faster time when we do the FIMD multiplications. So this is mainly because we actually uh, delayed the inner recode as mentioned earlier. And so we perform the recode only at the intermediate field before needing to go over. So hence, it's much faster that way. However, by increasing the R, the R value of the inner recode, this actually results that we can only use, we can encode a total number of lesser points than the other one. So I, in some sense, there's some balancing needed if you want to talk about speed versus the amount of data that you wish to pack for composite uh, RMFEs. So to conclude, um, in this work, we actually showed a way on how to use small primes with homomorphic encryptions with almost the amount, same amount of packed data uh, on the whole generally. So we have two RMFE extensions, the R4 RMFE and three-stage record for, for composite RMFEs. There are some trade-offs when using FIMD, in where in a sense, FIMD multiplications consume more noise, but we get a better amortization speed up when using FIMD. And we also need to look at some kind of balancing between the running time and how much data we want to pack in this setting. And with that, thank you for listening. Thank you again. Yes. Thank you for the talk. Uh, so we, usually when we when we run the bootstrapping, there is one step that is somehow costly, where we have to homomorphically deep pack the message, you know. So usually for BGV or FEV, you would have to run some kind of homomorphic uh, entity, let's say. So it seems that your deep packing would be uh, harder to, to run. Do you have an idea about how your method would impact the the current bootstrapping methods that we have? Uh, so I assume you're referring to the kind of thin bootstrapping by uh, for the BGV bootstrapping. We right? use the thin bootstrapping when, when we are not packing several bits yes. in each slot. So you are packing half of the number of bits that you can pack, right, in each slot yeah. you, with your method. Yeah. Uh, okay, I need to check that out again. But essentially because uh, the bootstrapping actually uses small primes, the more efficient version uses small primes in this sense. So uh, we are hoping that this will actually allow us to pack more coefficients into that kind of setting because I think the current work is that you want to use the small primes with, um, if you try to instantiate the homomorphic encryption scheme with small primes, you get very little slots. So when you do bootstrapping, you need more ciphertext. So by with our work, we say you can pack more data so you don't need so many ciphertext to do the bootstrapping. Does that answer your question? And uh, also yes. like, because I think we can actually get some kind of speed up when we use this kind of smaller primes. So in this kind, we were thinking like, this is the kind of contribution to that. Yeah. yeah we have lots of time, so feel free to ask more questions. Uh, thank you for the good talk. And I have a short question. Uh, what kind of use cases or applications for the plain text of prime, small prime, such as F3 or F7 in your presentation? Okay, so uh, as in the earlier question just now, so bootstrapping uses small primes in the for the for the plain text. So that was one application we are looking at. There are also a series of works in our paper that talk about uh, people using small prime circuit, kind of Boolean circuit for the homomorphic function inside the work. So uh, you can when you use uh, small primes in the BGVFE case, and then you instead of designing the usual bit, uh, your usual word kind of functions, you can define Boolean circuits on that kind of ciphertext. So you can do like uh, equality and comparison circuits. So we have a list of literature inside the work there. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. I want to ask uh, when the plain text modulus is a power of two, 
if I remember correctly, then SIM packing uh, does not work in that yes, case. Correct. Will your uh, with your new packing technique uh, be able to apply? Uh, no, it will not work too. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, so that still will limit it to uh, prime power. Prime. Okay. Yeah, because it's based on the SIMD, uh, original SIMD, uh, uh, the SIMD factorization here. So this only works with primes. Well, if you're using pulse of two psychotomic, that is, yeah, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I have one question related yes. to your title and not your talk because it was called field instruction. So I was hoping that maybe instead of just addition and multiplication, we would get division for once. Also, oh, apparently it's not that. But do you see a do you see a way of getting directly divisions in FHE or it seems completely uh, out of bounds? Gee, that's a good question. I don't think we can get division like naively from this in this setting, but I think it would be interesting to look at whether when we do division in uh division of the oops a uh, division of the few elements and we can get a corresponding division kind of uh homomorphism into the fact into the finite field so, into the vector space so yeah i think that would be interesting to look at i don't know whether it's possible or not okay thank you thank you okay I guess that's it. Uh, so let's thanks all our speakers and have a coffee break. <laughs>